So. Okay. Um, so before we um, um, uh, continue with uh, substantive content, I mean, we, we, you know, you guys were to so, supposed to learn a bit about serious games, and we talked a bit about serious games last week, more intuitively. Um, there uh, are, of course, a few aspects, and uh, the discussion we just had about the resources in the widest sense, uh, I think, are kind of good, good prompt to immediately move to that direction for for a second. I just want to go back to the wiki. I, I know that. Um, some of you have not uh, seen the wiki uh, simply because you only um, signed up uh, or on short notice. Let's see if we find some. I just got a request that I just to respond to. So everyone is hopefully uh, in the wiki as soon as possible. You see, should see the wiki main page. Many of, you, many of you have seen it already and hopefully read through. We briefly iterated through it uh, on in the last week's session. So let's see if I get you here. Well, uh, last week's session, but there are some minor amendments that I just want to draw your attention to. Um, so here's basically uh, what we expect for the course. So you can uh, reflect on this and we'll, we'll go through this uh, over time again. Again, you're supposed to give a presentation um, which involves the, um, you know, a general uh, topic, but also very discussion of very specific topic, a specific paper that um, we you are supposed to moderate, but the class is supposed to contribute. So that's on everyone reading this and analyzing this paper. We give you also guidelines on how to do those things, right? Analyze and read papers critically. And this is a, a skill that's not only relevant for this particular course, but that's you know our intention is to 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 endow you with the skill for any sort of master course or any cause in any case uh, that you'll have uh, in the future. So further down the bottom, uh, of case you find the schedule, here's now the live stream link. I'll provide the YouTube link once uh, set up as well uh, for the recorded uh, videos as well. So you can have kind of reviewed uh, um, afterwards. One thing that I added, and I think you would want to um, um, kind of uh, do this briefly is, I will use the issue tracker. I uh, may have briefly mentioned that before or possibly hopefully in the last session, but uh, the idea is that this is basically a software development environment, but let's let's not be too uh, narrowly focused on that particular feature, but rather use it to our benefit as a learning environment. And we have an issue tracker here. Um, that's something you arrive at when you click issues that allows you to post new issues. So you can basically say, hey, um, this is, you know, um, you know, um, found an interesting resource, for example, and then you can provide your your content here, you know, so you can make uh, uh, provide detailed information, and then we can assign so-called labels, right? So uh, and there's a set of labels that are now, uh, for example, pre-configured that you can use, and you can submit this issue then, and it will be available to everyone in the course. That's the main point, right? So that's kind of a communication tool. And then once such an issue is established, I'll just have a uh, demo issue, so that then I can easily remove it later, or we can isolate it quite cleanly later. Uh, I have a question. So, don't mark it as confidential, but important use labels. That's very important. And I'll tell you why in a bit. So, once we create an issue, it's upvoting, downvoting. Now, that's not the main point. The more important point is you can also comment on issues, right? So, if there's someone who has, has a question, a comment, or so on, or, you know, post a resource, and you say, oh, I can't access the resource, like the Serious Games book, for example, you can write those comments here as well. And, um, this is a nice way of kind of keeping track of different conversations in a way. Uh, we can, of course, close issues as well when they are, you know, uh, solved and uh, no longer really uh, problematic, but they also can spark interesting discussions as we've seen in the past. And this is really uh, nice to kind of keep it all in one environment in a way and uh, quickly accessible. For you to be, so how that looks like for you is that you will have basically a list of issues, now being the first one, a question lodged by me. Um, but in order to get notifications on new issues, uh, you will need to subscribe to different uh, labels, right? So we have an announcement label, for example, a question label. Um, I have a new label now in mind since I'm just uh, talking about it. We can make an ideas label, um, issues related to ideas. So that's where you you can uh, you know be creative. Let's make this pink, um, and um, so now we have different labels basically, and uh, depending on the label you attach, then uh, people get get uh, a notification of this. And the idea is that you subscribe to all labels. Well, you should subscribe to all labels that are basically uh, listed here. If you don't do that, you don't get notifications. So that's the only uh, caveat here. So please just subscribe to all of them. So meaning if anyone posts something with a label attached to it, you get a notification by email. 
the email you used to sign up in GitLab, basically. Um, and that's quite nice. And I will use this using the label announcements to post future announcements. Right, so it's a lot easier to keep track uh, for me and others as well um, um, in the course. This will be very important when we get closer towards the second part of the um, course. And um, I think Jun Gunnar did something on my issue already, I think. Um, yeah, so um, yeah, that's like a non issue, exactly. Um, so, but, but once we get closer to the second part of the course, that is when you present about different topics and give insights, you use this issue tracker as well to post announcement, you know, that you, for example, have a uh, selected specific paper that you expect everyone to read for the next session. That's where this uh, label is for. We'll, we'll, we'll get back into this discussion later in the course, but I just want to highlight that there are uh, various aspects that are um, relevant even for you, uh, not just for us to communicate to you, but also to communicate uh, amongst yourselves, hopefully. All right, so um, long talk, short message. Effectively, just subscribe to all the labels there. So you get notifications per email. So the whole thing is somewhat integrated. The other aspect uh, I want to draw your attention to is uh, some resources that uh, I posted in the meantime. Um, specifically, um, the, the, the um, for example, introductory resources, which are more high level. They're basically just a set of different games, for example, videos as well. Uh, so very straightforward to just get a feel of what, uh, uh, um, you know, to, to, to get a soft entry, if, like, if you like, into serious games alongside some examples. For a bit more of an in involved resource on serious games um, and literature resources in particular, we are uh, having research-based masters. So ultimately, there is a research component. You also need to be acquainted with um, research literature more, more intensely, uh, you know, YouTube and tutorials and so on are helpful or blog posts and are of completely fine for the sake of discussion. And you can also bring those into the discussion as part of your uh, presentation. But fundamentally, you'll also need to acquaint yourself with the um, uh, peer reviewed lit literature in that corresponding area, right? So, and uh, I kind of listed some initial sources here, generally some journals, some of them are already defunct, but nevertheless, they have good archives with uh, great uh, papers in there. And some of them are kind of borderline serious games. So they are they're like um, related, but not uh, only focused on serious games. So you'll see, uh, you know, um, the first journals are more intimately related to serious games and then becomes incre incrementally looser. Um, in, in, for example, the journal, uh, journal of Computer Game Culture in the widest sense is, of course, not focused only on serious games. And then there are books. Uh, amongst the, uh, those is the book that I um, um, posted uh, last week, but there are other books as well um, that are useful. So there's a more recent book, but it's very specific on law enforcement agencies, so training activities uh, associated with serious games. We get to that. And distinctive articles that I'll uh, reference quite a bit uh, throughout uh, lectures and so on. And this is a nice uh, web resource just to get an overview of different games of different types. So it's kind of more or less just a listing of serious games that you can pretty much immediately um, review if you like. Okay, um, that's basically um, from, from the kind of uh, wiki side of things. So I'll continuously post some sort of resources that you know will introduce into the uh, course that you can make and should, in fact, make full use of um, when it comes to kind of identifying your areas of interest. So, okay, was there anything else? Um, any questions? Who thinks I talk too fast? If no one else asks any question, a bit sometimes. <laughs> Okay, thanks. I I I um I try to reflect on this, but I'm really bad at this. So uh, you can just stop me. I don't know where the sh the, the the slow down button is. If you can slow me down somewhere, like in YouTube. Um, but uh, yeah, my apologies in advance. I'll try to uh be be more conscientious. Oh so, um, yeah, uh, I know that this go slower button is mostly just like sort of like the raise hand. Yes, no one. The other buttons is just shows that marker right next to the name. Uh -huh. Yeah. But I would encourage people to use that go slower button because that tells that does show up so that it indicates that hey, it is going perhaps a bit too fast. Yeah, that sounds good. No, no, I need that. Thank you very much. So you, you guys need to manage. But, but all, me. All, yeah. other than that, I think uh, just interrupting also works uh, because I think if if one of you think that uh, Christopher or I or anyone else is uh, speaking too fast. 
be sure that there are at least uh, 10 others <laughs> thinking the same thing. So, so just speaking up and ask us to slow down might be a good idea. Yeah, uh, go slower for the live live sessions and then when it becomes a recording we are free to go at three times speed that's right yeah I'll, uh, let's let's try that that sounds like a good idea yeah cool all right um but are there in fact any questions related to um wiki issues or any of this infrastructure it's kind of i know it's a lot of infrastructure built up right now but i think it's really fast again i think it's really important to be um uh, on this quite early so everyone is on board and then we have a seamless communication as well any questions so far i think i proved everyone so far into the course uh, into yeah into that wiki uh, in as far as requested Oop, i don't see any comment yeah there's the raised hand please yeah speak. so uh not exactly related to literature, but I am curious about how group allocation is going to work. Yeah, um, that's a very good point. Uh, we get, we will um, um, probably start with this uh, next week or the week thereafter. And the reason I push this a bit back is that we want to all have kind of a bit of a shared understanding of uh, serious games and kind of uh, you know go out a bit and think about in uh, serious games independently. But fundamentally, how it will work is that we'll provide a set of topics, but you may also provide a set of uh, topics or individual topics, just as a you know starter basically. And uh, you then indicate interest for those topics, right? And then we'll allocate you accordingly. So basically based on priority. So the idea is in, in practice, that's how we have done it in the past and it worked quite well, that you can identify topics of interest uh, with priority, right? So uh, higher, lower, medium and so on. And then uh, based on that prioritization, you should get allocated to a given topic. And it happens to be usually with someone else, of course, that has a similar interest. So um, I didn't have the impression that it worked terribly bad in the past. So I think we'll commit to this um, approach. Um, but uh, yeah, that's the basic idea. So we want to avoid you being necessarily pairing up. You can, in principle, of course, pairing up yourself strategically, and we can't prevent that. And we, we don't even intend to. But I think it's also a great opportunity for you guys you know, to, to be out there and work with someone you perhaps do not know yet. I, you know, because that's how you basically will have it in your future research or work setting anyway. Um, so it wouldn't hurt to kind of um, test the waters a bit. I mean, I appreciate that it's a bit harder in a digital setting, right? So because you don't have this uh, immediacy, I guess, um, and, and, and and generally physical space. But um, uh, also, you know, hopefully uh, later in the semester, things will be less problematic with respect to the, um, um, you know, access restriction. In fact, you have access to the buildings already anyway, but it's just that we're not holding lectures there at uh, this stage at NTNU. Does that make any sense, Jan Gunnar? Sort of. Cool. All right. Sort of. Good. Um, all right. So I, I try to follow the chat. Sometimes I miss it. You can just uh, uh, barge in. Basically, remind me to look at the chat if I don't do that. Cool. Um, all right. So no um, particular comments or um, questions there. So let's. Um, um, get a bit into it. So in 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 this week, uh, or in fact in the last week already, we started to have a bit of an introductory overview of um, uh, of, of serious games, right? I asked you to reflect on what serious games are, and I actually was impressed uh, that you are pretty much spot on already. I, I guess many of you actually have some sort of uh, background or at least a grounded intuition of what serious games already are, and hopefully played some, likely played some, in fact, and. Um, so the, 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 the course is structured uh, following this introductory session with a bit more of a deep dive into serious games today, hopefully. So everyone gets goes away with a, a distinctive understanding, but also um, a set of examples that you guys can um, that you guys can can take home and reflect on. So um, this this will be, of course, a very, very essential, um, very essential point um, for, for this session. Then following this one, we look into game design. I'm not sure in how far we get into that topic today or only in the upcoming week. Uh, we look into psychological models uh, specifically. We look into um, education or learning as a particular uh, topic related to CS games. You will learn, uh, well, yeah, well, there's a bit of a uh, reflection there. So uh, you will learn why um, specifically. 
And um, I think those are the main kind of topics we talk about, the notions of awareness associated with um, uh, serious games. And on top of this, we also have a session on how to perform a literature reviews. Because again, as I mentioned before, part of your submission at the end of the semester will be a literature review. Um, so in kind of, we better prepare you for this, I guess. That's the message here. And again, this is kind of um, um, transfer knowledge that you can easily uh, adapt and use and you know take away for um, other courses as well. So there's, again, some, some generality associated with this. So, um, but then afterwards, as I mentioned last week, that's your turn then. You take over and basically uh, talk about particular topics in serious games, provide us a bit of an overview by doing your own research, and then we'll discuss about um, specific papers. So throughout um, the next few weeks, we uh, we will be encouraging you to think about those topics already as they come to mind. We'll you know give you some pointers, but it's perhaps best to, for you to come up with a theme or topic that you're interested in yourself, because likely it is likely that you're more more motivated to a topic that you are self you self assign than to a topic that we assign. So that's the idea there. Okay, um, serious games. So uh, last session. So let's uh, let's see how interactive we can that uh, can make it we'll see how that uh, uh, pans out in the end so last session we talked about briefly about serious games um in a nutshell what are serious games you had the right intuition so if you recall the word cloud from last week you'll probably be on top of that anyone just speak up could you please uh, repeat the question again it was a bit too fast for me to oh play. yes thanks for reminding me Matthias. um the, the, what is a serious game what do you what's your understanding of a serious game based on last week's um, uh, uh, Mentimeter uh, kind of uh, input, but also based on your understanding right now. Mm -hmm. There's no wrong answers per se, because you'll find that, you know, uh, serious games is kind of a bit of a fuzzy concept. Yeah, um, I think serious games are just games that, uh, not just for fun, not just for entertaining. It has another uh, goal like uh, learning or uh, uh, some physical, uh, uh, I don't know, uh, uh, purposes or health purposes, it's not just for fun. It's mm -hmm. to learn something uh, new. That's right. So question then, if we learn something new there, why do we need to make it a game? I mean, I we could just say, hey, you know, here's, here's your maths task. Go for it. Now you hopefully master linear algebra or I don't know, whatever it would be. Yeah, okay. but that's uh, this way. It's, it's going to be more appealing and more uh, uh, people will will uh, want to do it more. Mm -hmm. That's right. Right. So there's this 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 subtle is this. Uh, I I use the word with caution, but intentionally with deceit uh, to kind of uh, trick the, the the player into you know doing something that is seemingly fun, but in fact uh, underlying it is actually a, a, a deeper meaning, meaning learning something as opposed to just having just being entertained right so i think the uh, one of the keywords is often used in this conjunction is uh games that are not just for entertainment here right so um yeah that's right cool um so let's see if i get this yeah can i add something yeah. oh absolutely please uh so ex exactly i have a feeling like this um gaming factor is is it just the cover uh for for the real reason of learning and this educational aspect i have the feeling is the most important but also in this uh, book um, the introduction mm -hmm. that we were supposed to read as a homework mm -hmm. uh, the author are very clearly uh divine, dividing serious game from gamification mm -hmm. and uh, i would also like to um, ask a bit uh, how those classes gonna be? Is it that we're gonna do a bit of gamification, a bit of serious game, or we're gonna have more focus on the serious game? Uh, because the the book they are recommended to read has a title serious game, uh, but the classes, as far as I see it in the time plan, are gamification. And for me, uh, it's um, uh, important because uh, I was thinking that it's gonna be more towards uh, gamification and app design and more UX. But again, this serious game is more towards actually building totally new uh, product and in those uh, that have this uh, aims that we are talking about. Yeah. So uh, to, to respond to that, yes, um, the title of the course indeed has both elements, uh, gamification and serious games. So, but the course in itself is anchored on serious games. And the reason is quite simple. In fact, 
all the elements that you will use or possibly or generally refer to as mechanics that you may apply for gamification in a you know conventional application setting website or you name it um you'll find all those in serious games generally but uh, the the key is there that the whole game serious game is centered around integrating uh, all those different features but it wouldn't keep you from a kind of you know dissecting it and uh, taking those features and into in, injecting those into you know other forms of non-game applications if you like and we we'll, this we explicitly talk about uh, some of those aspects um uh, particularly the mechanics underlying it, uh, possibly in the next session, either this or the next session, depending on our progress here. So I'm um, not hard and fast on this, but the idea is there that um, you can basically then uh, systematically pick and complement your application. The the, the 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 other aspect here that I want to highlight is, um, in addition to holding um, giving gi or a, as an alternative to the research-based approach that we generally do in this course, where so everyone talks about a given topic. It may well be an option for you also to talk distinctively about gamification, perhaps in a particular context of applications that are, you know, um, uh, relevant to you based on your, your research or your current studies, or uh, more generally in the widest sense. But as a further going beyond this, another option is perhaps even to uh, attempt gamification of an artifact that is an existing uh, application and so on. So as an alternative to doing a, you know, a research report on, on, on topics um, that you know, have been presented or developed by someone else, you can actually um, kind of what we would call do a bit of a development project that you can then talk about uh, your plans for it. And then of course also write about. So there's this, this flexibility that we want to keep in the course. Does it make any sense? Uh, yes, I understand. And when it comes to your personal interest, uh, what is more interesting uh, for you from, from those two? Me as a person? Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, I think my general notion is um, going towards serious games because of the integrated nature of them, because it integrates so much. The risk of gamification is, or put it this way, um, and feel free for anyone to, to kind of interrupt me there. But my impression was that over the last year, especially 2012, uh, mid of the, the 2010s decade, there was a bit of a hype of gamification. So everyone felt they need to have some sort of reward and some, you know, learning and some uh, and so on features uh, built into sort of any application or um, they could possibly find. And um, the, the risk is there that this has possibly been done with with limited reflection. So basically you have a feature, you know, added to an existing game or whatever else or an application and so on. And then suddenly you call this gamification. But the uh, the important thing, and I think this justifies having it on the, as a master's course, is the methodical use, right? You want to know the theory behind it and it needs to be, a, you know, methodical uh, use of all those features, those mechanics to integrate those into uh, 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 applications. And this is something that serious games do better because they think about this holistically, whereas uh, in a gamification context, it usually feels more like an add-on to a game that has already been developed. And at some stage, or in often many cases, uh, it may actually be worthwhile to challenge gamification applications to see if they actually have merit and value, right? And that's something, um, if, if you want to do that, I encourage you to do that. Perhaps take some gamification examples and kind of take them apart, dissect them a bit and see uh, what they actually, what the, what the developers intend to do by introducing gamification features and uh, what possibly actually happens, right? Or what are the unintended consequences, the side effects. Um, but again, that's a long answer to a very short question. I generally have a bias towards CSG. Saruna, you have um, something to add? Please. Yeah, let, let me add to that because I, um, I think it's not necessarily that clear cut that serious games is always good and well done and gamification is always bad and, uh, and better done. So, so I think, and it might not always be that easy to say whether this is just gamification or serious games, a little bit of both. So I, I don't think dividing is a two binary or a binary category. Dividing the two is, is, is fruitful. I do share, Martin, I do share your, your uh, I think, your worry that the, the gamification has been used for marketing. It's something new and exciting. I don't really care about what's inside the package. But I, I can assure you that Christopher and myself, we're very much going to come back to alignment 
is the gamification or the series games features well aligned with the series purpose? And then whether it's called gamification or series games, to me, that's an in, not so interesting discussion. I, I don't like those labels because those labels are limiting. I, I think what's, what matters is, do we accomplish uh, the objective of making it more enjoyable? And not just that, because games, they have a few other features like, naturally adapting to the current skill level of the player. Uh, it has this gradual progress. It has lots of other mechanics that don't necessarily have to uh, be uh, directed just to make it more fun. It's, it's to make it more uh, natural way of learning. And now whether you call that adaptive learning or you call it games, I don't think the labels are important. I think what is important is, is how we apply it and, and how we use it and what is the the aim and the purpose. And if the aim and the purpose is to try to cover up something boring, but just making it fun, I fully agree with you. That's not what we talk about here. Mm. Yeah. That sounds good. Yeah. So thanks for uh, complimenting this um, yeah, discussion. That's that's good. So um, I guess um, I, I, I share the encouragement not to perhaps see that as distinctively as it sounds like. But you will nevertheless will, will drill down into distinctive mechanics that you'll see in selected games. So it will be quite quite interesting to kind of think about this. So I mean, you jumpstart a bit of a thought because I think it's really worthwhile topic to kind of look into, you know, so um, uh, ex post gamification, if you like. Um, of, of uh, existing um, applications and so on. So there is, there is value there. Um, but let's, um, let's, let's center the discussion a bit about the, the, the kind of serious games idea more generally for now, just to have kind of a starting point uh, for, for kind of shared understanding. So something, I mean, you guys all, uh, already kind of identified what are serious games uh, in, intuitively anyway, but here's usually the kind of, uh, default, uh, the, 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 the idiomatic definition of serious games, um, as they, as they laid out by, uh, up in 1975, uh, in the, I think, I believe it's the second uh, edition of the book in any case, but, um, that was the first kind of, um, uh, um, well, serious attempt, I guess, to, to define, uh, serious games, right? So games have an explicit, carefully thought out educational purpose and are not intended to be played primarily for amusement. So that's basically the, the essence there. Nothing to learn by heart, but it's worthwhile to know um, that resource in particular, how, in particular to recognize how old the concept is. So question to you, um, what was the first serious games? What were the first serious games? Um, you know, when, when, were, when were the first serious games developed? Intentionally or when the term was coined? Yeah, well, not the term was coined, right? So we the term in in well, there, there's anyway a bias here because it's the English term in the first place. So that was roughly around that 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 time frame, but uh, more the games uh, that have this kind of characteristic. And again, as Rune mentioned, it's kind of fuzzy anyway. But any feeling? I mean, again, uh, I'm not counting points here. It's just uh, to jumpstart a bit of a thought process, perhaps. So I would think like something like um, sort of like the elementary school math games. Mm -hmm. Okay. So perhaps not necessarily a digital game, but some mm -hmm. sort of game set in a classroom space for uh, uh, young students. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Uh, any other thoughts? That's um, actually a very important uh, uh, um, topic area in, in those games. They're absolutely right. Cognitive development. Yeah. But any other thoughts by anyone? Well, the thing is uh, actually, um, um, you know, well, not only reasonably, but very old. So, um, I mean, the, the, the first games that could be construed as um, uh, serious games in the widest sense, but really in the widest sense, that was uh, in the second to third century. Um, um, as we as we know now in the uh, Arabic world in particular, and there were or are still are Mankalas type ga uh, type games. They're still played to date, uh, usually um, in, in the Middle East quite a bit, but also in Northern America and uh, less so in 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 Western Europe, I believe, uh, or rather Northern Europe, in fact. So, but the idea is they are uh, just to draw the link is uh, basically to kind of have a. Uh, a game that uses the metaphor of um, agriculture, of course, right? So the idea is that you need to uh, distribute seeds uh, on the one hand um, um, systematically. Uh, on the other hand, you need to kind of 
gain seeds from your opponent player, right? So, um, and there's no the Mankala game. It's a type of game. So, and the rules vary widely in in, in different ways uh, and so on. But it has been around for 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 um, for, for centuries and uh, was and is actively played still. But it has this metaphor uh, borrowed from uh, harvesting and uh, you know agriculture in the widest sense. So it, that's a bit bit unclear whether the game builds on that metaphor or it actually helps teaching about. Uh, um, uh, agricultural activities as well. So that's, of course, uh, very fuzzy, talking again to the fuzzy nature of serious games. But this is often referred to as one of the first serious, serious games uh, because of its direct link to, uh, um, you know, relevant environmental relevance, right? In as far as relevant for the people. But um, more important point, and that's something you made, Jung Gunnar, is um, they don't need to be digital at all. Right. So, I mean, uh, in fact, the fact that we do something with computers is just an artifact of modern uh, uh, development uh, technology, you know, reach marketing markets in a wider sense. No one would keep you from devising a board gate in the a game in the first place. And in fact, that may not be the worst of uh, ideas to, you know, attempt something as a board game first before thinking about um, scaling up and kind of translating it to the digital realm. But of course, um, given the way in which the cause is held uh, to, to, to that extent, but also the uh, obvious development in, in uh, recent times, it's uh, nowadays primarily understood as a digital variant there. So, and just to give um, one of the earlier, let's say, let's, let's use this as the earliest um, digital example, I guess. Um, um, it's the Oregon Trail uh, game. And uh, just some historical context, the Oregon Trail, there was an, uh, basically an activity in the 1840s, um, uh, very, very relevant uh, um, um, challenge was to identify uh, in the you know developing US um, to find a link between California um, or uh, well I guess nowadays Oregon in the north and uh, the east of the United States right so which was uh, well um, developed you know had some proper infrastructure and so on but still this linkage was still uh, disruptive there were you know a lot of um, hostile uh, situations be it climate weather or um, the um, the native Americans and so on uh, but there was the drive to kind of need to find a way and settle in the West, right? So populate the West. So it's a bit of an important narrative in the uh, American uh, history. And uh, uh, to this end, in uh, 1971, there was a development of um, this this uh, game called Oregon Trail, literally, that focused on this particular trail and uh, was developed with the intent to um, learn about the, the hardships, the challenges, uh, uncertainties associated with this journey because it was very dangerous, right? So all, if you think about your typical picture of the uh, conquering of the Wild West, that's roughly what the Oregon Trail kind of uh, uh, reflects to some extent. As I noticed a chat message. Hang on, let me just see if I figure that out quickly. Is there anything relevant? You can just speak up in case I don't respond to the chat because it's hidden right now. Um, so, and the first game literally uh, was uh, uh, de uh, developed for those um, educational purposes and uh, the graphics were quite limited, right? So the graphics were literally by teleprinters because you were able to play it remotely um, and you get, get kind of feedback uh, that uh, you have, ba or basically the game was uh, developed in a way that you had 12 rounds of decision-making. So you had kind of uh, rounds um, in which you need to make uh, certain calls. Uh, and each of those rounds represented roughly two weeks on that very trail. And it tells you something about the distance you have, the resources you have, and so on. Um, but then there are also um, options to, you know, for for example, buy additional resources uh, in order, you know, to survive that journey. Then there are uncertainties such as uh, in adverse events and so on you need to react to, and better you better have the right equipment. You see, for example, there's a not, uh, notice of uh, food, bull uh, bullets, clothing, miscellaneous supplies, cash, and so on. So all those those elements played or had some relevance in the context of uh, that particular uh, serious games based serious game based on the setup but it was played remotely and this was literally the output you would get so how exciting is that would anyone still play that game well probably perhaps right so i mean there may be some uh um 
someone is really keen i mean it's like remote chess uh in, in in the earlier days but i guess this was actually an educational tool they, this was actually revamped and further developed um in, uh, in 1985 in a more visual form where it's actually you know meaningful uh well visual feedback in the widest sense that's probably more akin to what you guys if you have played monkey island or one of those um, uh, um uh, games um then you, you probably feel quite reminded here as well and that's basically um the idea so it was one of kind of the first uh, visualized uh, representation that was available uh, for that particular game but this is considered one of the first uh, serious games uh, with particular focus on intentional focus uh, as you noted uh, it was by um, issued by the minnesota educational computing consortium with the intentional focus of educating about the hardships of this journey right because modern day students probably couldn't relate to the challenges that they had but um by by making this accessible in some way or another this was really the purpose of this particular series game there were um of course a lot of different games that were more or less unintentional series games uh one notable is uh battle zone so now we're moving to the area of arcade games right which you wouldn't probably see as uh the basis for series games in the first place but um, here you see beautiful vector graphic highlighting, uh, I think uh, a tank simulation, it is, uh, that's right, a tank simulation uh, that it was, but it was basically played in an arcade style setting, but um, had that uh, uh, flair of kind of attaining skill in actually, you know, uh, controlling and moving a tank, particular by, based on the kind of replication of the controls you would possibly have in such a, a setting. And this, well, this is probably a bit more by, um, uh, 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 by happenstance, because this game was originally only conceived as an entertainment game, but it was later actually adopted by the U.S. Army to uh, kind of, you know, uh, and further developed, of course, not in this crude form with the vector graphics, as you see in the lower right, but actually to train um, tank uh, uh, management, tank handling. So there were, in fact, quite a bit of... Um, important steps in the journey of serious games or significant games and i encourage you to perhaps look up of some of them i'll go through some of them to provide you with a bit of an intuition there but uh following the book there were for example the oregon trail better zone that i just mentioned um uh, bradley trainer is a yeah training training game pole position i get to that game in a second and a set of military applications for games so you see um the uh, idea of military training is fairly as opposed to general training is very pronounced in uh, the history of serious games, uh, especially with respect to significance. And then later on, we have more like training games that are out that are outside of this um, uh, kind of kind of perspective. So, um, right. So um, let me go through some examples uh, of that. So we, um, one of the uh, earliest examples was uh, Star Wars on the, uh, in the top left. I denoted this as being, um, well, reasonably recent. Um, but the idea basically was they had to use this as an introductory training for, you know, sniper or general, um, you know, um, military activity. Um, please apologize my lack of um, terminology there because I haven't uh, dealt with the military too intensively. But in any case, uh, preparation for operations, right? So, but it was basically just a starting point for the training. A more comprehensive game that is still in use in, in further developments is Virtual Battle Space. Um, in fact, you, one last year, one of um, the students actually gave a reasonably extensive talk about this game because they had, uh, the, the, I think the student had experienced as part of his military training himself. It was quite uh, quite interesting. But this really puts you in different settings, right? In ambush settings or in uh, in open terrain settings or um, we're using different vehicles um, in, in the widest sense. So it was really made for that purpose. And then there's also a debrief afterwards and so on. So there's little doubt that this is actually kind of a serious game in the training sense. On the lower left, 1982, um, it's, you know, uh, one of those earlier uh, games and uh, um, called Pole Position. And this was um, arguably the most important racing game ever. Uh, until to date, you may you may not know, ne never have heard about it, but it was basically such a massive um, uptake um, and kind of with the intent to kind of get a bit of a feel of what Formula One style driving would look like, um, that it was um, so important that it basically shaped any sort of racing game that came thereafter, including racing games that are more, um, uh, you know, made for training purpose, actually. 
And the lower right is a very modern example, 2012, but the figure here is slightly more recent, is X-Plane. Uh, many of you will know Microsoft Flight Simulator, for example, as a simulation game for flying and so on. But X-Plane was actually uh, developed with the intent to kind of simulate more explicitly uh, the physical environment than, 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 for example, Microsoft Flight Simulator had done in the past. I'm not sure about the recent version. That could be quite interesting. Some of you who are into gaming may have known that there's, uh, you know, recently, I think in 2020, yes, there was a big release of the recent version of Microsoft Flight Simulator. I think that got far more realistic because it actually uses uh, actual uh, geodata. But uh, x was built with this intent, both for training, training uh, pilots poten potentially, but also for entertainment. So it sits as this fuzzy boundary, but clearly towards simulation of realism that we that we find there right so and those were some of the more uh, some of those, those those significant milestones i guess in the history of serious games this is a reference of one of the papers that you'll also find your resource section section the lamati paper um that's listed in the wiki okay um right before i move to ingredients i think we need to have a bit of a break right everyone wants to have a breather because i'm talking too fast and uh i don't see your faces so i can't read your emotions but um how about we reconvene 10 minutes after one is that okay it's an eight minute break so yes. and then we just continue there okay. and i talk a bit about the ingredients yeah yeah good cool thank you So we are back. I hope everyone else is as well. Sometimes the uh, digital void makes it just very hard because I don't see your uh, faces, but I just hope that you are um, returning back into the course. In any case, I'll record anyway, so um, there will be no loss. But perhaps um, before we continue, um, questions from your side or comments. Perhaps someone has experience with a serious games or, or, or any game really that they would see or want to kind of contextualize in the context of serious games uh, right now in, in uh, reflection to what I talked about just now. Anyone? Well, yes, uh, I'm doing master's degree now in Tallinn uh, in digital learning games and we have more mostly focused on serious games now. So I'm here as an exchange student. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And is, 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 are there particular games that you are, or, or, or uh, comments, if you like, but, but are there particular games that you have in mind when you think about serious games that, or, or you know, ideas that you, you got based on the um, aspects we talked about so far? I have one, ex uh, one experience with serious games. It was called Malaria Invasion, and it was developed by an American uh, university mm -hmm. to teach students uh, malaria and biology and how cells are infected and so on. Very nice. Okay. That sounds like a serious education game, right? Isn't it? Yeah, yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. Cool. That's nice. Bear, bear this in mind. I think that's really good. If you, um, depending on your topic of um, specialization that you want to do, and others, of course, it's something to re-inject, right? Because that sounds like a very interesting game. I haven't heard about this. Uh, uh, we had a, quite a bit of different games that were about, you know, infectious diseases and so on, but, but not uh, that one, at least. So that um, sounds like a very interesting choice. Anyone else? Well, there's an, uh, games on Xbox, I think, with uh, the Xbox that has a camera. That you need to follow some uh, physical movements, dancing or training, exercising, and the uh, if you get the right the moves right, you get uh, more points. And it's uh, serious gaming that, that you physically doing something healthy for your body. Mm -hmm. Very nice, very nice. So that's that's um, uh, health and well-being, right? So it's the topic there, uh, and it's also a form of serious games. Yes, um, I think I mean one of the I'm not sure if it's the earliest, but uh, uh, if I recall correctly, one, uh, the, the, the uh, Wii was quite uh, well known for this, right? Uh, as one of the earlier consoles to kind of 
attempt this by playing virtual tennis and so on. Yeah, exactly. If I recall correctly, but that's like 13 years back or something or 15 years. So that's quite some time as well. Uh, yeah, that's a very good point. So that's this. The, those are good topics for if you um, want to look into um, health and wellness as one specialization of serious games, which you of course look and it's one of the biggest one. In fact, next to education, those are the two kind of um, central themes that uh, uh, serious games are nowadays li linked to or uh, gamification in a wider sense. So yeah, that's uh, I already have two have uh, now two topics already, but we'll see more of course. Anyway, I'll uh, just move on a bit. Um, to to see, um, Rune, um, do you want to? No, okay. Yeah, I, yeah. I can, if I can interrupt here, I can see Jung Gunnar is uh, asking whether it should be called serious play rather than serious games, okay. mm -hmm. and and it's an interesting one because I was also thinking and wondering whether I should raise that issue before we had a break, and that is, uh, quite a few animal species use play as the way to learn. So gradually get exposed to more dangerous environments and you play in safe environment, gradually get exposed to more. So so learning through gaming or, or through play at least seems to be a, a natural way of, of learning, a safe and natural way of learning. And, and uh, yeah, maybe we should call this serious play rather than serious game. I, I like the Yudar's comment there. That's a, yeah, that's good. Thanks for bringing this up. I think um, it wasn't com completely serious when I wrote it, but <laughs> yeah, glad, glad that but, it is something good came out of it. So, so here's the thing, right? So you're gonna any anytime you put something in, uh, we try to read it from a slightly different, I guess, from my academic perspective, and suddenly um, there's of course a distinction you have introduced that is the one between play and games. So now we're in trouble because now you need to explain us what the difference is. I mean. Humoresque in a sense, if you so, anyone. I will humor you. So yeah, play is like a fun activity. It not necessarily has any rules. So like play is like when a child is just first playing around with toys, like say that he has like a, a few bricks that he is stacking up. It doesn't seem like he's following any rules or stuff. He's just playing and exploring right now. Mm -hmm. And afterwards he might say that this should be stacked in a certain order, then it might become a game as he has introduced a rule to it. And the goal is to see how he, how he can stack that tower. Then it, it's, a, it's a goal and so it's a game. Yeah. In fact, you didn't humor me at all because you're absolutely right. Um, those two terms you introduced, rule and goal, are central to the distinction between games and uh, play, mere play, right? So in the widest sense. So um, in, in, in this slide, you have introduced the meaningful subcategorization, right? For serious games that are just serious play and serious games that actually have a goal. Um, <clears throat> because, I mean, uh, the goal uh, that of the serious games may not be the same as the one that you would, uh, as, uh, you know, see for the game, right? So if you're in a racing game, the obvious goal is to be first, right? Whereas the actual goal from a serious game perspective would be to kind of improve your driving skills, if you like, right? So there's that distinction that uh, uh, sets apart regular games from serious games, but the game versus play distinction is also worthwhile to note. That said, all the games that I uh, referenced before all have some game character indeed, because they have distinctive rules and goals uh, and are not just uh, uh, open-ended. So if we think about an open world game, right? So like, um, 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 uh, what are recent examples? Red Dead Redemption, I believe, or uh, GTA, and so on. All those more modern style uh, open open world uh, genres. They can allow both, right? So you can do have mere play, or they can have also the meaningful storyline that you actually follow, right? So um, I think it's a very important distinction you have introduced here. Also, something that could be discussed uh, and exemplified as part of your. Uh, specialized uh, as your talk, if you want, right? So we are really open, Rune and I, with respect to the directions that you take it, but as long as it contributes to the discussion, and I think this actually has merits in, in terms of understanding and uh, distinguishing between those concepts more more, more, more immediately. Um, any other comments, perhaps, else? I'll just... As you will find, I favor discussion over presentation, so... Um, that's your opportunity, but we'll have ample opportunity for discussion uh, throughout this course anyway. Okay, um, 
So what are the ingredients of serious games, right? So uh, now we distinguish between play and games, but what are the ingredients actually? What, what do we need to think about when we attempt to construct a serious game? Anyone? A goal of what is to be learned. Goal, okay. And what, what else do we need then in order to kind of come up with a game? Rules. Rules, yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. Certain rules. Maybe certain game flow. Game flow, yeah. So some sort of narrative storyline, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Interactiveness. I didn't pick up on this. Can you repeat it? Interactiveness. Interactiveness, yeah. Sure. Interaction is very important. That's right. I'll just write this down because there's a lot of good points here already. We have so anything else? Well, we have a good baseline. So you guys are more in the weeds than I expected it to be. So I mean, fundamentally, it's really about the basic principles, about putting together some theory, right? So theory is generally about, um, you know, um, well, if you have an education game, there's an educational theory. Or there better be an educational theory behind it, educational uh, objectives, and how do you realize them? We're going to learn more, much more about theory when we talk. Uh, uh, when Rune talks about education, I'll talk about psychological models as well, and so on. So, any of those, this, 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 this um, background that links theoretically uh, the game to the actual, you know, uh, learning or development inside the uh, individual, that would be the theory in the widest sense. Then we have the content of the game. So that's closer to what Lama just described, uh, I think a story, right? So uh, if I recall correctly. And um, so you need to provide some, some content that keeps the user engaged, right? So Oregon Trail, for example, you need to have, um, um, you know, the, the story of actually making the 3,500 kilometers uh, trail from, you know, east to west and so on. Um, and then there's game design as a mitigator, basically, you know, how can we link cleverly theory that should of course not be overtly visible um, content which is generally quite visible you know uh, in a way that the user can actually interact with this right so that's uh, i think alan you mentioned that um so interactiveness so and then also um, that's that's where rules come into play and so on so there's of course a bit of complete oversimplification but i just want to uh, uh, um, kind of uh, draw your abstraction level uh, a bit up and saying you know well, what are the general principles we need to look into and kind of to have a somewhat integrated uh, serious games conception this is in fact um, the basis of the one more of the more complex uh, game design frameworks we're going to talk about the one by win um, but uh, this is, is so over complex in many respects that we sometimes extract from it but we'll talk about certain aspects so um, but the uh, idea of, of serious games has also been characterized uh, a, a bit differently when when we look especially from a um, uh, from an implementation point of view um, well here we can we can see for example that we assume that certain certain learning activities right it could be skill development let's say uh, flying a plane it can be knowledge development let's say learning about maths um, or um, any other form of learning that's basically relevant and then identifying how serious games kind of comes about from those different distinctive disciplines pretty much like the the origins of serious games and even in the examples i showed above already um we had um, um kind of kind of uh, an, an instance of each of those categories right so we have l pure learning games where really the objective and the content um, and the uh, game design is kind of really only about learning, right? So it really tells you about how to calculate a, 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 a linear, you know, algebra, uh, um, for example, or uh, geometry using some sort of visual output, right? But there the game doesn't obscure this, but actually it was more like an application. It's really about uh, teaching you um, that learning. Then there's games on the lower right, which are distinctively about uh, gaming only, so entertainment centered. And then there's simulation on the lower left, right? Which is um, detached from games. Um, simulation and games, is there a conflict, anyone? Why, Why? you know, isn't isn't that any any racing game, some sort of a simulation as well, or not? How accurate does the simulation have to be to uh, be a good simulation? That's right. Can you give a bit of an elaboration on this one, the accuracy aspect? It's like, um... 
you mentioned uh, driving games there. So it's not too difficult to get some sort of rudimentary dr driving mechanics to be implemented into a game. It's just uh, at least for modern modern game developers, it's just hey, you you move forward and turn around and stuff. But what about all the problems of real life driving? Is it like when it's wet, do you have less friction? What about the weight distribution of the car? What about the turns, the slopes and whatnot? Is all that accounted for? Yeah. So um, building on this, uh, with accuracy comes a challenge. Right. So if you suddenly need to think about, well, stay, staying in the context, think about uh, snowy roads or icy roads in the widest sense, or simply wet roads or uh, uh, in, 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 in different forms of aerodynamics or uh, thermals and so on, right, in a, in a flight simulator, for example, um, they introduce a different challenge level. And oftentimes this is in conflict with the game objective, the pure game objective that would be fun or entertainment, right? Because it's very, very hard to ride, drive a Formula One car in kind of a realistic form um, and, and so hard in fact that it most likely wouldn't be entertaining anymore for, for the, the casual gamer in particular but very entertaining for the casual race driver if you like or um, in, uh, uh, someone who intends to be in the first place or again those military training games right uh, whereas in, in the game world it's really about having this quick opportunity to get kind of this, this, this fun notion out. So there's a bit of a friction there in terms of accuracy. So um, um, games are, that's why we have a general differentiation between simulation games and arcade games, if you like, uh, where the latter ones are really more focused on fun only. Anyway, all those uh, games or th those different uh, origins, if you like, so uh, applications for learning, simulations and games, kind of they have overlapping elements, right? So, and um, in as far as we discuss some of those, uh, what would be construed as uh, serious games nowadays would have been game-based learning, for example, in, in, in the past, this kind of intersection um, uh, more explicitly. But it's important to highlight that, uh, you know, those those uh, elements don't exist in isolation, but there's always a certain overlap where, for example, uh, learning and games are entertainment games, but they don't have a simulation component. Training games are more likely to have the simulation component and so on. Rune. Yeah, I'm just wondering why interaction or intersection between learning and games is called entertainment games. I thought entertainment wouldn't necessarily be learning. Why isn't not edutainment? Because edutainment was used specifically for entertaining education. So edutainment games, I would understand, but entertainment games wouldn't necessarily have to be so learning. Would that what what is what are uh, games that are um, entertainment games were not learning or I mean uh, it mm. seems to me that it might have been edutainment that they had in mind not entertainment but uh, maybe I'm wrong. Possibly yeah, yeah that's right especially since the paper is on pedagogy computer science and games right the interlinkage but I think it's part partially perhaps related to the fact that they really didn't pick up on education but they just talked about learning right so this is a bit of an older paper but uh, it just shows the path depends of you know how the same concept can be labeled in different terms but if the top uh, area would have been called education in the sense opposed to learning as an activity, then it would be certainly more indicative to um, uh, write entertaining uh, games in the first place. That's right. Anyway, uh, just, just an overview of kind of the different dimensions we can think about, right? On the one hand, we have the idea of having content theory and game design. On the lower level, okay, what are the traditional uh, applications or games concepts that are now linked up in order to form serious games? That's the basic idea. Uh, behind it and uh, it, it, it has certain um, brings certain f features about that makes for example serious games or learning in the context of serious games different from the from from traditional learning right so um, now looking more at the kind of uh, learner perspective and Rune pointed many of those points out and we'll, we'll reiterate over those again and again and again but the main point is that serious games are generally, uh, a, you know, replayable. So the idea is that you don't to kind of just finish um, a game, have 100% completion, but you should have an opportunity to kind of enjoy the play the game again uh, in order to learn even more, right? By exploring different pathways, for example, um, or not having distinctive um, <clears throat> Boolean wrong or right kind of answer to a certain problem. <clears throat> The other aspect is emergent storylines that's actually increasingly picked up by modern games in the edu education, no, sorry, in the entertainment sense, of course, 
um, as well, so that you you know don't have necessarily a linear game anymore, but actually you have slightly different game perspectives um, depending on on your choices in the game and um, perspective taking so that you can actually play a game from different perspectives as well. It's often uh, a feature of serious games that you can find. The uh, uh, military simulator is such a game, for example, where you can assume the position of the radio operator, the, the, the you know um, operational staff on the ground and so on. <clears throat> the other aspect that is um, very relevant for uh, serious games, and in fact, it should be the case for any game, but again, particular for serious games, is to accommodate the player skill level. Why would we do this? Don't we want to have a, you know, I mean, Runa was earlier talking about learning outcomes, right? So we have a certain objectives that you want to get across by learning something, learning a, I don't know, programming language. Why don't we just say, hey, uh, no, 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 we define a skill level and then you kind of, you better uh, kind of uh, accommodate this as a player because we want that everyone has the same learning outcome. Why do we have accommodation of player skill level? Maybe for the game, not to be too boring or too hard for the players. That's precisely right, right? So it's really about this balancing idea as a, as a, as a keyword there in this context, where you want to, that's the game bit, we want to keep the, um, the player engaged, right? So it's not just we define the pace uh, and challenge, but the player should be able to do it um, um, uh, herself or himself. So that's uh, the main point there. The other aspect is asynchronous play. So it doesn't necessarily need to be a real-time play, but also giving an opportunity for learning, for reflection, uh, or um, if it's a multiplayer setting for actually not affording a real-time setting necessarily. So that's a very uh, characteristic of a, of a serious game as well, right? Turn-based um, uh, games, for example. So the, um, uh, the question is always, okay, when or should we use uh, serious games, you know, how do I identify that I am in, um, let's say, in a teaching setting or in any sort of uh, learning setting in the widest sense in which uh, serious games could be useful, right? So, um, and, uh, you know, the, the, the question is that what, what are the opportunities that uh, serious games actually offer from a, from a learning perspective that we should exploit uh, and, you know, use as a basis to um, create serious games in the first place, right? So, um, what uh, well, generally, uh, when do serious games fit well? When, you know, it's generally good if you know what a clear specification of learning objectives are, right? If you're running a course, for example, and you want to teach about uh, or any sort of activity or you're in a gym and so on, when you want to achieve a higher level of fitness or greater environmental awareness or advanced cognitive skills, um, then it's really helpful to think about it from a perspective already of a... Um, Serious games, serious game. But what is what is the central difference there? Well, uh, I mentioned the repeatability of the game, and that usually means you need to think uh, about about the game not as, as a finite activity, but as a continuous activity, right? So that there's uh, reinforcement over time, reinforcement with slightly different goals, right? So you know, first you um, need to achieve a certain fitness goal, and then you you add to it by adding new skills, for example. I mean, perhaps spinning first, and then you have some sort of element of, of jogging embedded into it, and then with increasing challenge levels, mountain um, activities as opposed to flat uh, running. In, I mean, I'm making it up here right now, but in terms of a gym setting, for example, if you could imagine. Um, so it becomes uh, an open-ended game de, de facto that allows for different um, uh, uh, learning of um, you know, continuous learning and development. But the more, more central part here, and this is really where technology comes in, I guess, is really the continuous monitoring of progress, right? So just one, one slide earlier, we talked about the accommodation of player skill level, and that's precisely what facilitates this, right? It's really a very tight feedback loop between uh, player and the actual game um, as it, as it um, um, is planned out. And this can be to an extent that the game actually changes storyline in order to accommodate the player's uh, levels. Um, and that's the that's the kind of uh, main objective um, here in particular. So when it's about education games in a more classical sense, um, you know, such as learning about uh, yeah, cognitive skills in particular, then it's not so much the guidedness anymore um, that the game offers, but also to uh, encourage the you know player to go beyond, provide additional resources, link to external videos to. Uh, um, yeah, any 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 of that kind in order to 
um, drive the player to kind of move beyond the game itself, not just fulfill the objectives of the game, but actually, you know, develop own motivation interest. And Rune mentioned the keyword already. If the game manages to bring the player on the path of uh, developing an own motivation, so to kind of internalize the motivation to learn a particular skill, become better at something, meaning, for example, you play a serious game and uh, or let's say a health app, jogging app, whatever, and after some time, you don't need the app anymore, but you just go willingly uh, or voluntarily, if you like, uh, go jogging and nevertheless aim to improve your skill and pace. Then you kind of really uh, achieve what the game was want to do. That was the idea of seeking alignment, right, with the objectives that the game initially has um, with your own personal motivation. There was a, uh, there's a raised hand I see. Please speak up. Yes, I just wanted to mention that um, I, my brother's friend made mm -hmm. a serious game uh, uh, for people with Asperger's where he made a puzzle game, but uh, in social settings, because obviously people with Asperger's often are better at solving puzzles, but struggle in social situations. So he made a puzzle game where the puzzle was getting through the conversation. Um, and I th just thought that was really fascinating in terms of, as you were talking about, um, motivation and you know them going out after playing the game and trying the strategies that they've learned and stuff like that this is brilliant this is wish i had that 10 years ago yeah it's a really smart idea brilliant and this is really brilliant i encourage you when we get to that later stage to really perhaps you know uh, spend some time on discussing that day and showing it and if there are some sort of um uh, results as well or insights right based on the use of that game right so it's on the one hand you can have a game but the other one is also kind of learn from it as as, as, as a developer or designer of the game in the widest sense i think that would be really interesting under the kind of health theme of uh, possibly uh, of of of, of um, the topics that uh, we could talk about so um, great thank you very much for sharing this this is a really great example. We actually merged two distinctive uh, uh, competences, if you like, right? Um, expanded competence, one, the, 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 the cognitive and the other one, the social, and kind of tried to link those via game. That's really brilliant. Very good. Um, yes, um, the, 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 the beyond, uh, in addition to going beyond or seeking alignment, right, with what the game intends to do and, you know, what you actually want to do afterwards, the other aspect is also that, uh, and I think that really brings it just back to the Asperger game, is the contextual bridging, where it's really about linking knowledge and uh, skill, right? So, you know, knowing, uh, for example, how to fly a plane uh, is, 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 is good if you have a theory, but you kind of need to know how to do it as well, right? So, and that those games can actually provide this linkage more immediately than you know a book for example because that could well help you to develop the knowledge but probably may not be as good to develop the skill right so and also while while you're sitting in the plane it's probably a good time or not a good time to think about the theory but actually uh, better have the theory handy and ready so the game can actually help here as well especially with respect to the um, intermittent nature meaning if you can uh, interrupt the game and you know uh, learn in uh, in the meantime or where needed okay so um i mean this is a lot of a lot of uh, theoretical perspectives but uh, kind of to 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 manage this linkage between learning and serious games in particular it's always worthwhile highlighting you know how that would could work for example uh, when, when we try to operationalize this practically right so here looking in particular from a learning perspective um, uh, only if you like, so not so not necessarily um, you know um, necessarily health or other ones, but you could translate it accordingly. Of course, is that you have some sort of you know objectives that are con you know con transformed into explicit challenges that are expressed in the games, right? So the game kind of puts you in a situation that you need to show that you lo learn those um, 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 skills or the knowledge that's necessary, right? So. And uh, where, for example, a, a book, of course, has certain ways of characterizing knowledge, as I mentioned before, in, uh, you, can, you can make it more accessible by, for example, using imagery. Um, and uh, basically, the, one of the aspects, and the third one is a very important one when we talk about skill, it's about translating um, knowledge into skill in the widest sense that you may learn by instruction, right? Uh, one telling you how to... Uh, again, fly a plane if you like, but actually by doing it, you develop a certain intuition that complements this. And afterwards, you don't know. Uh, uh, you may actually forgo even thinking about the theory. I'm not sure if any one of you plays an instrument, but if you had um, 
you know sufficiently engaged with the with the with the uh, instrument you actually start to unlearn the theory but uh, e extend on uh, developing your skill in this uh, play uh, of the instrument in itself um the other aspect is to uh, translate kind of the um disruptive to some extent learning steps or incremental learning into kind of a more interactive experience right so um that that's basically the idea it's all about experience and instead of using kind of distinctive tests or assessments there is some sort of mechanisms that can be either explicit based on points or rewards but also based on the adaptivity of the game right so um because sometimes you don't need to need don't even need to let the user know that you actually marked them or scored them or ranked them in some way in many instances you wouldn't even know because the game should adapt itself to the learner skill uh, and, and and you know provide incremental challenges uh, associated with this so there is this uh, element of uh, responsiveness so kind of summing it up a bit they need to be interactive um there is a, a game experience that should link to the uh, target audience um, embeddedness in an educational setting, meaning you need to prime the player what, what it's really about. I mean, if you want to teach someone about uh, uh, biological functions, it's probably best embedded in a biology class in the first place, as opposed to a generic education setting, if in a wider sense. But it needs to be uh, um, framed accordingly and uh, sensibly. So uh, the game itself does not replace, for example, uh, an introductory session that kind of introduces certain concepts, possibly. Uh, or motivates at least to play and to take up and play that game. And this frames in many respects the attitude uh, uh, of the player as well. An important aspect is actually, uh, that's very relevant. I always need to remind myself of this as well. Serious games are not always a good idea, right? So serious games should be used when the players, hopefully, are actually inclined or interested in playing uh, that game in the first place, right? If you have individuals that are uh, really have an adverse attitude or uh, the inability to play games due to physical limitations but also simply you know not not wanting to engage with games in a wider sense then serious games are probably not the way to go either right so we need to um uh, be mindful of this the last aspect is um the boundaries of uh, gamification right so there are certain aspects you just don't want to play with in as much as you don't want to joke about it, right? So those are uh, sometimes diseases um, or uh, you know challenges that individuals face. Uh, one should be mindful of um, um, cognitive or psychological states of individuals. So just putting a game out there and hoping that it, or forcing everyone to play it may not be clever if you don't know the target audience well enough. Health games are particularly at risk uh, to to hit ethical boundaries. Um, so that's uh, one thing to to bear in mind. So that it's not always um, good to use serious games for everything, but it's about a two-step process, figuring out is serious game or is a game in general something you want to use to promote learning? And then more more specifically, uh, you know, um, how can you create a game setting that uh, actually teaches something by satisfying some of the earlier criteria, such as being interactive and uh, embedded in an educational setting? Comments or questions? No one so yeah um but um perhaps there uh, if you have any examples of games that probably shouldn't have done in uh you know that shouldn't be played that's perfectly serious as well cool um all right so we revisited most of this one um all right having kind of a bit of this background of uh, a, a high level motivation of when or when not to use serious games the principal ideas the markup and so on now i kind of want to draw a bit on since we have a few minutes left to talk a bit or get closer to the ideas of of, of, of game design um and this is this is quite relevant uh, please interrupt me anytime right if there's something you want to contribute or you um i have overseen um your your chat messages or um raised hands so um of course when we talk about serious games uh we don't get around dealing bit or laying the foundation of thinking about game design more generally and um this is uh Im important from two perspectives first of all of course uh, because you need to think about how to map um your objectives that you have if you for example develop a health game onto concepts as they exist uh, or are used for game design especially in in the computer setting um on the one hand and uh, on the other hand it's also learning about the mechanics that are available to you in the first place right so i mean if we know that individuals play a game on console we know what kind of input devices they have at their avail 
uh, what kind of screen sizes they have, resolutions. So, so there's this whole linkage between the kind of infrastructure in the widest sense and uh, to the objectives. And this is generally best done by looking at kind of day game design principles. And bear in mind about the many aspects that I'm perhaps talking about here is they are not really distinctive for uh, serious games, but really more relevant for, uh, uh, for, for, for games in general. Uh, so there's this is this fuzzy area again that there's no real uh, unambiguous methodology that is uh, distinctive for games and serious games more specifically. So it's a bit of a blurry one, but nevertheless worthwhile learning about, <clears throat> especially since you can draw on this later doing your own presentations as well. If you think about mechanics, uh, if you want to look at gamification, you can draw those linkages as well by understanding the game design that's uh, underlying it as well. And what I produce, provide you here is not so much a detailed in, uh, uh, insight into all the different methods, models and so on, but I want to call them out. I want to point you to some, you know, high level, uh, give you some high level understanding of different uh, uh, methods uh, or, or, or schemas or principles and so on, which you can then revisit and kind of think about, okay, that one works for me, or this is actually good, uh, a good metaphor that works with my understanding of serious games, or that's something that uh, fits better for health applications or for educational applications and so on. So you can kind of use those uh, blueprints, if you like, to kind of critically review those and see how they actually fit with your understanding. And I'm usually, uh, or I, I explicitly invite the um, um, design um, students amongst us because they have a very different perspective, right? You have background in design thinking and uh, other um, uh, techniques that you put uh, forward that we don't, uh, uh, now looking at the applied computer science um, students, that we don't really teach as much, I would say. Uh, I say it with caution, of course, because our students can also take design courses. Um, but perhaps you have another perspective or another concept or model that would fit here in quite well. So if that's the case, I'm really interested to learn about this as well. So feel free to interrupt me at any time. So um, one of the models I'm talking about, uh, just because it's uh, somewhat reliant or aligned with the learning idea is really more like a process oriented model by um, by um, Garris at Ali. And, um, the idea is to see the game um, or, or the design process more in yeah, well, the design process, the game development as a process, literally, right? So, um, and that's that's basically um, the idea. So it doesn't call out for distinctive mechanisms that um, or, or dynamics or concepts that uh, need to be implemented per se, but rather suggesting that there is a mix between game characteristic and instructional content. So here, let's think about domain such as, uh, you know, uh, learning particular skill, health, uh, um, uh, awareness, you know, for example, in, in environmental awareness and so on, which can appear rather blend on, on its own, but you want to kind of make it more accessible. So we, we link it with game characteristics. What those are is, is secondary at this stage. We talk more about game mechanics later on. And those are then uh, linked basically in this kind of design process, right? So where it's really about uh, thinking about uh, how one can link the user interaction, for example, um, user um, exposing the user to certain um, um, concepts, immediately focusing on the feedback of the user. So the tight interaction is very important and um, the responding user's uh, behavior, right? So if you have a system adaptation in the environmental uh, awareness example, um, then you can observe how the user actually interacts and adjusts its behavior. And the game should ideally drive this continuous cycle of, you know, uh, responding to user behavior, provoking new user behavior in a way that it leads to the uh, linkage to of uh, with the learning outcome so that user actually develops a positive association with environmental awareness and perhaps even uh, that it mitigates a behavioral change if that's part of the learning outcome, right? For learning, for example, uh, about oil pollution of water or fresh water, if you like, right? So then this, this whole model thinks about how is this, can it be systemically related to the individual's uh, feedback. And um, the idea is there that it's always linked with, uh, and that's quite common for serious games, that it's always linked with a debriefing session. Because uh, as part of the education, I think Rune will talk much more about this in, in another session. It's really about uh, having a reflection of what I just did. It's not just enough to play the game, right? So even if I play a serious game and do so without much reflection, I may just have played a game, right? So, but not really something, taking something away from it. So the debriefing, making it explicit, reflecting on it, discussing on it, writing about it, whatever it may be, is really, really important. 
And all those military games that are referenced earlier, uh, they have precisely that feature, that they have a mission debrief every time at the end, where they really talk about um, what, what they did, uh, what could be done better, and so on, right? So similar to football teams they, who meet for debriefing after each game as well in order to ensure that they reflect on what went well, what went, you know, what didn't go so well, and what they could do better in the next uh, cycle. And the idea is that this uh, concept is adopted in uh, game development more systematically. So another framework, and this is a heavy one, um, uh, uh, kind of, you know, don't, I'm, all the models that I'm suggesting here is not so much really to, or not at all to learn them by heart, but rather to kind of understand the core principles where they're coming from, but perhaps also draw inspiration for your understanding, right? So um, the wind model is a very heavy one. It's probably, it's the heaviest one I'm going to talk about, um, but only uh, because I there's another model I just want to spend more time on, which is more fundamental. We get back to that in a bit. And the idea is really that, um, in, 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 in this work, uh, the design play experience framework, um, it's really about uh, having a more systematic linkage between the designer of a game, serious games in particular, but uh, well, for our instance, but for any game really. Um, so, and the player on the other hand, right? So we have kind of the designer perspective that is linked. If you look at the top uh, row, for example, uh, designers activities that is linked via play to the experience that the player has. Right. And then we have on the uh, uh, the respective um, uh, rows on the left, learning, storytelling, gameplay, and user experience, they are kind of meant to mitigate this uh, respectively from a very high abstraction level. So again, learning, what are the high level objectives? What, are, what do I want to get across, right? What are the teaching mechanisms I actually use and how do I achieve learning on the you know consumer side, right? So we have on the left side, more like the producer side, in a sense, what's the input into the game? And then the right side, the consumer side, the player side, uh, how do I ensure that they actually take something away from it, right? So, and while you have this very high level uh, uh, um, uh, objective, then you will uh, furthermore contextualize it with a story. And one of you mentioned that early, right? So there needs to be some sort of flow or story, I think, Lama, um, that that kind of links um, this, this high level concept with specific, um, uh, settings, for example, again, environmental game, you kind of want to have a virtual setting that corresponds and invites for reflecting on it, like an ecosystem, involves characters, um, and so on. And then you need to, of course, not only have the setting, but also a, a play around a storyline, right? So something happens, and then there's a choice, a user choice in response to this, right? So and the system needs to guide that story in response to the user's activity, right? So user may have certain activity or choices, and the system needs to adapt to it in order to promote and further that play, and ideally thereby, um, you know, uh, building on, 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 on this uh, setting, uh, um, kind of uh, produce some learning outcome. From a game play perspective, and this is really close, we get back to this uh, very important one, is the linkage between the kind of the uh, infrastructure from a technological standpoint with those higher level objectives. And it's generally stratified into the mechanics. So what is it avail? What can I actually use? Be it uh, based on you know uh, visual features, uh, what kind of sensors can I use, uh, uh, or, uh, or what are, what sensors are kind of linked between game and and player, right? Via, for example, a desktop machine. You know, you have a display, you have audio output, you have keyboard input, mouse input, perhaps gamepad input, and so on. Um, what are the interactions that I can actually then afford doing this, right? What can the player actually do, right? There are certain limitations as to what you can do generally, and then how do I link it to emotions? Because generally the learning is mitigated by emotions you want to detect or have a salience associated with certain uh, uh or sorry a valence associated with a certain um activity a positive or negative right if you observe for example unjust activity uh, you want you know you likely feel bad about it and want to rectify it for example if you have positive feedback that it likely uh, stimulates you further to think about this and kind of treat this as a positive concept so this emotional linkage with the ability that uh, that we you know the feedback that you can provide to the system and the mechanics that the uh, game actually uses the, this is a very important one in order to afford gameplay if we don't have this then we don't have the linkage between the tech and the actual objective which is this one here of course having learning ultimately and then from the uh, in the most specific case it's really about the user interface what are the distinctive kind of uh, 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 you know breaking it down very distinctive features that uh, our technology actually provides that. Not so much principled, but really about what are the kind of uh, uh, tools, toys, and um, 
sensors and uh, and so on that you can actually use in order to uh, create some sort of user experience and that's where you as a designer um, not you as a designer, but the design students amongst us come actually in because they have a, a distinctive focus on thinking about those aspects. And I think this would really be great if someone would take up that challenge and uh, talk about this as part of one of the topics, because I think that's something we can all learn a bit more about, uh, in particular from a from a um, applied computer science perspective in, in many instances. But this is one of the, or this is the heaviest framework I just want to reference. Of course, you get the slides. By the way, all the slides will be linked in the wiki uh, under the corresponding session. So it's very easy for you to iterate through this. But I just want to highlight this framework because it's quite, quite heavy uh, and, and fairly involved and has those different layers um, as well that, that show you that we operate from, from a very high abstraction level with our objectives uh, to a very specific implementation that is, of course, linked to a very particular game. Um, but also that it differentiates between the designer and the player perspective on the other hand, right? Those are the two dimensions that you kind of want to realize there, not the nitty gritty in between. You can cleanly and easily replace some of those terms with something that makes more sense to you. But uh, understanding those dimensions, that's the main uh, point here. Um, any questions? If, if not, I leave you on a softer note, and that is uh, the the uh, uh, the last frame I want to talk about in this session. And I talk about this frame because it has the, received the most attention. This is really one of the most uh, accessible frame, and most referenced frame, in particular from a, uh, a game development perspective. And this is often driven because it's so uh, focused in many respects on this interlinkage between the available technology and kind of the you know uh, uh, game experience. And here, game experience in the widest sense can relate to the, the learning, but also perhaps mere entertainment, because this is really uh, um, um, a game design framework that is developed in the context of strict game development, right? So it was actually meant as a technical report as an idea, but it has been taken up quite widely uh, and has gained incredible accessibility. And it's based on three very simple principles um, that is kind of are related to the WIN framework you just saw before, the DPE framework. And um, it also has this perspective or the focus on uh, the designer and the player. In fact, the WIN framework builds on it. This one here is a bit earlier, it's from 2004. And uh, the idea is that a game needs to be um, uh, analyzed from the perspective of the designer, but also from a perspective of the player. And they have different linkages. You saw earlier already that we have kind of game design and play and then experience linkages. And here in this model, this is called mechanics. So what is available um, 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 from, a, from, a design uh, from a designer perspective, you know, to create a, a game principle, dynamics. What are uh, the mechanics that a player can interact with. So if you have a particular um, you know, game setting, it's not all the features that you can actually exploit and use, but only a subset of it. But they make the game interactive and dynamic for the player. And then finally is the aesthetic, right? That's how the game looks like. And just to kind of illustrate this a bit more, um, more explicitly. So, I mean, generally it boils down to mechanics being the rules of the game in the widest sense, you know, what are the components of the game? What can be done in the game in the widest sense? This is really the algorithm kind of representation. That's why it's so attractive for game designers um, from, from a developer sense right now. Um, then there's the dynamics, the interaction again, and the aesthetics. So I leave you with this because I this is taken from a blog post, but it was very instructive, I felt. So I left it in this uh, slide set as well, which, promulgates hopefully fun again this is made for uh, conventional games not so much the uh, serious games understanding we have in mind but let me contextualize it with an example and i think a really good one is really a kind of a flight simulator because it's intuitively accessible and um, it highlights the challenges quite quite well so if you think about the mechanics that the game uh, possibly have has right so we can think about that we have some sort of you know, environment that needs to be modeled, uh, that is, you know, topology, geography. Um, we are talking about uh, climate um, um, and weather more immediately, uh, daylight cycles, and all those kind of uh, mechanics that are relevant in a game that kind of need to be represented in one way or another, right? So, and then we have this plane, of course, which uh, has um, certain behavior, certain facilities can be moved upwards, downwards, sidewards, and so on. So um, the, the, the idea is that um, 
we can do flight planning. We have probably flight assistance that can be provided. There's communication between the tower and the flight commander and all that kind of jazz. So those are the general dynamic uh, mechanics, sorry, that are used in the context of the game design more generally. The dynamics is the subset of those features that can actually be used by the player. Right? The player can, of course, control the game, uh, sorry, the plane specifically. It can likely communicate with the tower, right? So in order to uh, lift off or prepare for landing or whatever else, right? And of course, control all those uh, 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 bolts here and uh, knobs and so on in the cockpit of the actual um, um, plane. So that would be the dynamics. And then it's of course uh, on the on the far end then the aesthetics, right? So here's uh, just to highlight it's basically the visuals, right? So irrespective of what you can actually do, how does it look like? What are the emotions or what's what's the what's the what's the what's the sense you get when you play this game, right? If you look for example on the top left, uh, it it you know that's rather 1980s, but nevertheless it has certain aesthetics that were contemporary at that time. And if you compare it to the lower right, you have a completely level a completely different understanding of. Uh, I guess also of intuitions about that game, right? So where the top left one looks kind of really more technical, if you like, with all those uh, dials and uh, uh, displays that are involved there and this rather crude visualization of the landing process or starting process for that matter. And on the lower right, you have a bit more really richer uh, experience also impression of the environment as well, right? So this is really very different aesthetic that this uh, game evokes on that level. Right, so and this is the closest, of course, to the user um, perspective here. Okay, so it's really about uh, linking those two perspectives uh, to each other, right? So the mechanics that the designer has his hand, the subset of it, it makes available at runtime for the player to interact with, and then the aesthetics that are put on top of it, the aspect that the player sees first, right? So the player interacts in the opposite way they look at the game first even if when, when you think about buying a game you look at the aesthetics of course first and then perhaps you have a demo you can try the dynamics before you exploit the you know richness of the entire game with all the weather changes and all that magic that is expressed in the uh, mechanics for example right so it's made of perspective this is a quite simple framework um uh, uh, to, to, to think about. I'm not going further than that. I just want to leave you with this because we're having, we are now two o'clock, but I think we got a bit of a gist uh, of uh, some of the frameworks that you can uh, reference and think about when you think about games more, more, more generally, but also um, the importance, of course, the, uh, uh, the aesthetics in particular in order to capture user interest. If you look, for example, at the lower left here, this more comical, funny kind of setting that you could think a flight simulator could be made in, or this noir setting, which has a bit really much more serious flair, right? So it evokes very different emotions um, there as well and kind of motivates for different forms of player behavior, right? Anyway, I leave it at this. Any question, because it's now two o'clock and um, I'm uh, well known for going over time, so let's not uh, promote this too early. Any questions or comments at this stage? Anything we should look into for next week? Yeah, that's right. I mean, I encourage you. To, so uh, again, some of the frameworks is more like um, uh, referencing them, so you know that they exist, that they're there, and it makes worthwhile, maybe worthwhile to kind of review a bit deeper. I hope in many instances I gave the resources. Else, check the introductory resource. Uh, sorry, the um, one of the resources should have a kind of a bit more of a, um, a linkages to certain game design. Uh, frameworks, but the MDA one is something you kind of want to be familiar with because it's the mo most basic one, but it's from a game designer also a very clean one. You know, the other ones are a bit more uh, 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 varying in abstraction level, but this is really kind of very linear. So I think it's very operationalizable. Okay. If there are no further questions, I can leave it at that. You can, of course, also, uh, 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 you know, we'll start next uh, week again with a opening um, that allows you to discuss more questions or challenge some of the points that were made here. And of course, I understand it's a very uh, a lectury style uh, overview right now, but we probably slowly move into more kind of discussion style setting that allows you to contribute more um, as well. But uh, until then, I hope you have a pleasant week, in fact, a productive week and uh, hope to see you again at the same place at the same time. So we stick to that um, channel now. I know there may have been a bit of confusion of some people that actually used the last week's Zoom link, but we stick to that one now. Please, um, if you if you get lost where it is, it's always in the wiki. 
and I'll post uh, the slides, of course, so you, you have an opportunity to review them up to um, where we got today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye bye. Tucker, Tucker. Tuck, tuck.